This is The One Thing Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Adam Rindy. The One Thing Podcast brings together leaders in functional and naturopathic medicine to discuss actionable information that may unlock puzzles in the areas of gut health, brain health, metabolism, and longevity. Please note, these episodes do not replace the opinion of your doctor. They are not intended to diagnose or treat any condition. Please discuss this information with your provider and discuss your own unique personal health history before adapting this information. Please subscribe to our episodes so that you can stay on top of the most current information in these areas of medicine. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a condition of androgen dominance, is one of the most puzzling conditions for patients to deal with and practitioners to treat. In this episode, I welcome on Dr. Laura Bryden, who is the author of the Period Repair Manual. If you remember, she was on with us to discuss endometriosis earlier in this year, and she is an expert in understanding all things about the female hormonal cycle. She takes it upon herself to demystify women's health. She's really interested in teaching body literacy, so helping women understand their period and their menstrual cycle and their hormonal components so that they can understand what's happening to their body during these different phases. In this episode, we build on a previous episode where we had Dr. Shannon Hurst on to speak about some of the core components of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And in today's episode, we're going to go into subtypes of androgen dominance. And this is something that Dr. Bryden really speaks deeply about and writes about in her book, The Period Repair Manual, and on her blog. And she is going to speak with us about what is the different subtypes of androgen dominance. It's not just classic features, but we need to be thinking about what's going on with inflammation, what's going on with the adrenal glands, what's going on with glucose tolerance and insulin resistance, and also something called post-pill polycystic ovarian syndrome, or post-pill androgen dominance. This is a great in-depth interview. I hope you enjoy it. And for those of you who are dealing with androgen dominance, then I hope you learn some different tools and aspects to apply this to your own health. And for your practitioners, this will give you a different way to look and understand the functional components of androgen dominance and polycystic ovarian syndrome. So without further ado, listen in to our episode with Dr. Laura Bryden. Welcome back to the One Thing Podcast. It's great to have you back with us today. Hi, Adam. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Yeah. So we want to talk today about androgen dominance. And this is a topic that um, I'm very interested in. And so are so as many of my listeners. Um, I thought I'd just kind of go into hearing your perspective on androgen dominance and, and just kind of help us define what it is as an overview. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's becoming more common. Unfortunately, as many of your listeners may know, um, the state of women having too many male hormones, either testosterone or DHEAS or androgenodione, compared to estrogen or progesterone, and it's coming from a few places, which we'll you know we'll talk about potentially all the etiologies, but. It encompasses, of course, PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome, but it's more than that. I mean, you, there's other reasons for androgen dominance. And it, the, the problem with it, the symptom picture that it causes is, of course, hirsutism, facial hair, acne, especially kind of a more severe jawline acne, um, androgenetic alopecia or that type of hair loss, which is a widening part of miniaturizing hair follicles. And also in women having excess levels of male hormone promotes 
insulin resistance or metabolic dysfunction, which then in turn promotes higher androgen levels. So it can become a vicious cycle of abdominal weight gain and insulin resistance, promoting more testosterone dominance. So it's, it's, as you can imagine, it's, it's, you know, it's quite a, a difficult set of symptoms for women to deal with. Yes. And, you know, when I was going through school back in 2001, 2002, we were taught about just one type of androgen dominance, really, which was polycystic ovarian syndrome. And, you know, there was sort of a classic way that we would evaluate for this condition. And there was a class, sort of a refined criteria to follow. But it turned out in practice that this was much more complex than was shown to me. Um, and you did a great job and have done a great job really uh, educating on the different subtypes of androgen dominance. And I was hoping we could go through those subtypes a little bit more specifically so that we can understand that not all people with androgen dominance will, will fall into a criteria of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Exactly. And that, that's the job. That's always been there in the algorithm, the diagnostic algorithm is one of the steps is to rule out other causes of excess androgen. Andro let's call it androgen excess is the clinical term. So before arriving at the diagnosis of PCOS, or, which is a, diagnos like a diagnosis of exclusion, when, once everything else has been ruled out, my, my working definition for PCOS, I, quite, I think it's quite useful, is basically androgen excess, the clinical state of androgen excess, when all other causes of androgen excess have been ruled out. So some other causes, for example, would include the genetic condition, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is actually a lot more common than I thought. It affects about one in a hundred women. And it, that's a situation where the adrenal glands are overproducing androgens. And it's often mistaken or misdiagnosed as PCOS. And then other examples of clinical states that can, um, etiologies that can result in excess androgen excess would be hyperlactin, um, underactive thyroid, certain medications like valproate, the um, uh, epileptic medication, the anti-convulsant medications. And at the end of the day, and there's you know, a few other things too. At the end of the day, once, oh, and uh, Cushing's, I guess, any kind of, a, you know, not any kind, but Cushing's is another adrenal disorder that can result in androgen excess. So once all of those have been ruled out, and also once, the other thing to rule out is that if, um, to determine if the androgen symptoms are from, contraceptive drugs or hormonal birth control with a high androgen progestin. So that would be Depo-Provera, the medroxyprogesterone is very testosterone-like, levonorgestrel. So for some patients, they can be in a state of acne and hirsutism from the medication they're taking, the type of hormonal birth control they're on. But presumably once all of those have been ruled out, you're left with the diag diagnosis of exclusion, which is polycystic ovary syndrome, which I'll say off the bat has nothing to do with cysts on the ovaries. Hence, everyone's calling for a name change, which may or may not happen. I'm not sure. Hmm. What are they thinking it might be changed uh, to? There have been all sorts of ones floating. Uh, in fact, I was just looking at a list of them last night. The one I like, it was put forward by my colleague, Gerilyn, Professor Gerilyn Pryor, at the University of British Columbia, she proposed anovulatory androgen excess, which I really like, sort of describing androgen excess as the, the central feature and then the, the ovulatory dysfunction as a, a very important feature as well. Although technically with the syndrome as currently diagnosed, you, you can have ovulatory PCOS, which means you are managing to ovulate, but still have relative androgen dominance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really good to have a definition to explain kind of the core, um, the core underlying problem, because, you know, like you said, um, people who don't fit the criteria exactly are left with a lot of confusion currently. So like if they have the high androgens, but their ultrasound looks good um, and they don't have cysts on their ovaries, there's sort of this uncomfortable settling into the diagnosis Let's talk about the cysts on the ovaries thing. It's, okay. <laughs> it needs to be just thrown out the window, basically. It needs to go <laughs> because they're not 
cysts, they're, yeah, it's, it's one of those things in medicine where just that, that mess up, you know, that, that sort of early, I'm going to mess up, but you know, that early observation of these polyfollicular ovaries and the unfortunate calling naming of polycystic has just caused so much confusion. So first of all, as you said, it's a hundred percent possible to have androgen excess and then meet the criteria for the diagnosis of PCOS with and have perfectly normal looking ovaries and vice versa. It's possible to have poly so-called polycystic ovaries and have and not have PCOS, have nothing to do with PCOS. You know, I have potentially have hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is losing your periods to under eating, which is a very different situation and actually presents quite often with polycystic ovaries. The finding, the ultrasound finding, it's basically what it's describing. If you, if you can picture this, it's describing the lack of a dominant follicle. So in an ovulatory, and the thing to keep in mind is the ovaries are changing all the time. They're constantly forming new follicles and reabsorbing follicles, which are eggs. And so the, all, the appearance on ultrasound is going to look different month to month anyway. And if a woman's in a state of having achieved an ovulatory cycle or ovulation, that cycle, the cycle when she has the ultrasound, she will present with a dominant follicle, which actually is quite a large structure and actually looks more cyst-like than, you know, than the polyfollicular appearance. But Mm -hmm. there are lots of reasons to not ovulate, right? Like, so there are lots of situations where even a woman with perfectly normal hormones could have a cycle where she didn't ovulate and so can present what the the latest stat I saw, I was just looking at it last night, up to 40, 40% of women with normal hormones can show uh, polycystic ovaries on occasion. Mm-hmm. So you can see it's a, it's a normal, it can be a normal finding. The other thing that's really confused everything is the magnification of the ultrasounds that are being used now is a lot higher. So compared to say 20 years ago or 30 years ago, when ar- arguably back then, maybe seeing multiple more, you know, a high number of undeveloped follicles had more clinical significance. Now it, it really doesn't as if it was a high magnification ultrasound. So we're still using this cutoff sometimes of more than 12 follicles, which doesn't mean anything depending on the type of ultrasound that's being used. And also depending on the age of the woman, because younger women have more, more eggs, right? So just for so many reasons, the, the whole ultrasound finding, I think really just needs to be left behind. And that is not to say that ultrasound is not useful for other things, because of course it is, it's possible to have a abnormal ovarian cyst of Mm -hmm. various types, which is a separate issue, like an enlarged functional cyst or an endometrioma or dermoid cyst, or, you know, there's, there's other kinds of cysts that can form on the ovary, which are totally valid and can be assessed by ultrasound. And the other, of course, multiple other reasons to do an ultrasound, including just looping back to PCOS, including the, the, arguably the only reason to do an ultrasound for PCOS workup is to observe the thickness of the uterine lining because with severe PCOS and years of, well, you know, ongoing months or years of an ovulatory cycling or no ovulation, you'll start to get a thickening of the uterine lining, which is mm-hmm. clinically significant, which does need to be assessed. So as part of a- How so? Yeah, like, well, what, well, what would you, what's your concern with that? Yeah, well, that's the that's where the long term risk of endometrial cancer comes with PCOS mm-hmm. is year not just a few months but years and years of not ovulating. So you get this chronically thickened uterine lining that can undergo changes eventually, dysplastic changes. So that that's not a healthy situation, and and if, the reason it happens is because with without ovulation, there's no progesterone to thin the uterine lining and shed the uterine lining, which is why with PCOS, often you'll need to have some kind of induced withdrawal bleed, at least until you can get ovulations going, which Mm -hmm. just for your listeners, you don't need to do with hypothalamic amenorrhea. So with the situation of no periods because of under eating, there's going to be no thickening of the uterine lining. That's, I have a, on my blog in a couple of places, and I've shared on Instagram, I have 
a, a compare and contrast chart of hypothalamic amenorrhea versus PCOS and how to tell the difference clinically, which I would encourage everyone to have a look. I think the blog post is just, my blog post is just called, is it hypothalamic or hypothalamic amenorrhea or PCOS? <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Straightforward and you can well, look at it there. Yeah. Well, that, that's an interesting area to go into right now because um, one of the other things I'd like to clarify or challenge with the PCOS kind of diagnosis is there's been like this phenotype. In fact, I had a professor say that, you know, oh, PCOS is really easy to diagnose. You can see, you can see it in the, in the waiting room. And I always thought, you know what, that didn't sit well with me um, because she was basically saying they're going to have, you know, hair loss in the front of their kind of the, the male pattern baldness. Uh, PCOS uh, women will likely be overweight. They might have acne. But when I got into practice, I realized that is not really accurate. There's thin subtypes. Uh, and can you go in and, and kind of clarify that? Because that's that's still out there. Yeah. Well, that is interesting because that's still out there. And then at the other end, there is unfortunately also this with using the Rotterdam criteria, which I don't agree with, but there's this, you know, f- so-called phenotype of PCOS that doesn't have androgen excess, that is basically probably hypothalamic amenorrhea. So there's a it's a heterogeneous condition. There's a wide, there's a wide variety of symptom pictures that can fall under the PCOS umbrella. And keeping in mind it's a syndrome. So it's it's really just the label, the diagnostic label is really now just, as I said earlier, it's just to be applied applied to anyone with androgen excess that can't, or the androgen excess can't be explained by anything else. So that can certainly encompass women who do not have that classic picture that you're describing, who do not have insulin resistance or only have very mild insulin resistance. It's also possible to have insulin resistance and not be overweight. So that is worth commenting, you know, that's why it's still important to test for insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, so there's, there's definitely, and the other thing about the heterogeneous clinical picture is those women arguably have arrived at this, at the situation of high androgen or androgen excess by a different underlying mechanistic pathways. So it's not one disease. It's a syndrome. It's a set of symptoms that we've applied this label to. It's not one disease process, which unfortunately makes the research very troubled (laughs) kind of mishmash of conflicting findings because how can we be comparing, you know, women who have full-blown insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome with women who don't have insulin resistance and have have high androgens from adrenal overproduction, which would be the adrenal kind of PCOS subtype, which we can talk about today. That's like comparing apples and oranges. So to try to Mm -hmm. describe one disease process for those two sets of patients is never going to happen. Yeah. It's a very, of all, I mean, a lot of, a lot of health problems, there's there's some degree of this confusion of trying to um, apply the same etiology to a diverse set of patients. And but I think that with PCOS more than anything, that's that's problematic. It's it's just, we really in some ways need a back to the drawing board description of this condition, and I think we need to talk about it, start to talk about it as in terms of subtypes, like meaningful subtypes that would be a description more of pathophysiology rather than just you know subtypes of do they have well, you know polyfollicular ovaries or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's. That's so true. And I think your, your, your book, the period repair manual really does a great job in, in helping guide people through the different subtypes and action steps that are appropriate to different subtypes of androgen excess. And um, so that, that's a really good resource. Should we, should we talk about those functional subtypes now? Yeah, let's do that. So, and just to clarify this, to demarcate the subtypes I'm talking about in my book and on my blog, the four types of PCOS, these are functional subtypes from a, I would say from a functional medicine perspective, trying to treat the upstream cause. That's different than these, the Rotterdam four phenotypes, which are really just subtypes based on the diagnostic criteria, which is 
I don't find very helpful in terms of treatment at all. So right. the four, but the four functional subtypes that I work with are, this is the flow chart. I'll talk it through. And then there's a flow chart in a few places in my book and in my blog. Step one of the flow chart is very, the most important step as always on a flow chart, because that's where, you know, that's where the start to go down the wrong track if you don't get this right. But step one is, is it truly androgen excess? I guess that would be the question. I think in the, in the flow chart I call, is it truly PCOS? But the first question, is it truly androgen excess and have other causes of androgen excess been ruled out? So is it, are, are there some at least clinical signs of significant hirsutism, facial hair, or that, you know, um, frontal pattern of hair loss or severe acne or measurable androgens on blood test, keeping in mind that androgens are on an age gradient. So with older women, you're not going to see that probably because unless you, you, I mean, you do have to take the extra step of getting an age specific set of reference ranges, especially for the adrenal androgen DHEAS. Otherwise it doesn't mean anything. And then you have to have ruled out as I said earlier, you know, hyperlactin, thyroid, hormonal birth control, and adrenal hyperplasia. But once those have been ruled out, and once you're certain it's not hypothalamic amenorrhea or under eating being accidentally diagnosed as PCOS, then you can start to move on. The, and just to say in terms of hypothalamic amenorrhea, they can have polycystic ovaries, they can actually have mild hirsutism or mild facial hair, which is kind of makes it troubling, but there's, there are differences, especially in terms of measuring luteinizing hormone, which is kind of a lot of the time how I try to differentiate between hypothalamic amenorrhea and PCOS. But moving on with our flow chart, if it truly is PCOS or androgen excess, then the next question on the flow chart, and this is, it's, everything hinges on this, is there insulin resistance? you cannot assume there's insulin resistance with this condition. You do have to test. And I would recommend testing with, I do have like a dynamic insulin test. So fasting insulin and, and glucose, and then have a glucose challenge. And then one hour and two hour measure insulin and glucose mm -hmm. again. So in Australia, we call that you know, glucose tolerance test with insulin. It goes by, I think it also gets called the craft test. There's other names for it. So for me, that's the most useful clinically test to determine if there's, ins if there's ele elevated insulin or hyperinsulinemia or not. And if there is, then that's where you land on the flow chart. Then you, then the, the clinical strategy is to reverse insulin resistance, which is totally reversible. Plus with any type of PCOS, you do need to also be working on lowering the androgens well, reversing insulin resistance will help to lower the androgens, but also you can put in place some of the other androgen lowering strategies that I described, such as zinc is an excellent anti-androgen supplement for women in this situation. And there's, there's, you know, there's a, a set of other supplements. The other thing to mention at this point is that progesterone, real progesterone, that we either make with ovulating or that you can take as oral micronized progesterone has a beneficial anti-androgen effect. And so that's where the treatment protocol comes in called cyclic progesterone therapy, which was is promoted and discussed by my colleague, Professor Geraldine Pryor. She has written a few articles on that. And that's using two weeks on, two weeks off with a basically a natural progesterone supplement. For some women, not every not every PCOS patient is going to need that, but that's just another possible treatment to consider. Mm -hmm. And then, so we've got the insulin resistant PCOS of which another shining star there would, in terms of treatment would be inositol. Really can't pass that by. It's, it's done so well in clinical trials that it's included in the new evidence-based medicine protocols for PCOS. But moving down the flow chart, if, if, you're, if you're certain your patient doesn't have insulin resistance, like you're hundred percent certain then you need to look at other situations, other kind of upstream reason, causes that 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 she's that have brought her to this place of androgen excess, and one of them is post pill trying to come off, particularly the progestins drosperone or cipterone, which are anti androgen drugs. And so then, when you come off them, you can get this temporary androgen surge that usually goes on for a couple of years. 
And that leads to what I've called post-pill PCOS. And so a big part of the treatment for that is A, just understanding that it's going to be temporary and B, you know, working with zinc or um, the herbal medicine peony or some of the other treatments to try to shelter the body from the androgen excess while your ovaries get their (laughs) act together and start, you know, making ovulating and making estrogen and progesterone, both of which also have, you know, beneficial anti-androgen properties. So this is something that's really worth mentioning is that just achieving ovulatory cycles and making good doses of estrogen and progesterone every month has its own very beneficial anti-androgen effect. So that's ultimately from a functional medicine perspective, that's the goal is to regain Mm -hmm. ovulation. Mm -hmm. And just quickly finishing off my flow chart, if it's not post-pill, then I look at more of an inflammatory kind of active autoimmune inflammatory state that I have observed can contribute to an androgen hypersensitivity or shut down ovulation. And then finally, down the flow chart is adrenal PCOS, which is very similar to the congenital adrenal hyperplasia. It's an upregulated adrenal androgen production, but not associated with any of the genotype known genotypes for congenital for adrenal hyperplasia. It seems to be more of a functional state, possibly an epigenetic state. And that last one, if it's mainly primarily adrenal androgens that are ramped up, dialed up, that's hard to treat, unfortunately, but there are you know, some strategies you can try for that. So, so that, that particular yeah. patient would have um, high DHEAS, but not necessarily high testosterone. Yeah, exactly. So DHEAS would be the, is the androgen that comes exclusively from adrenal glands. It's present in, for many women with androgen excess. They can, you can have both testosterone and androstenedione coming from the ovaries and DHEAS from the adrenal glands. But the clinical picture when it's only... Basically, with most androgen excess, there is a large, pretty large ovarian component where the ovaries are overproducing androgen. But with adrenal PCOS, the ovaries seem to be fine. They're usually ovulatory cycles are regular, but there is this adrenal overproduction. And it, it, it makes sense, right? Like they're not, those patients aren't going to benefit from, especially if they don't have insulin, they don't have insulin resistance. So they're not going to benefit from all the insulin sensitizing aspects of treatment. They need something else. To so, yeah. and those patients will generally still have hirsutism and acne yeah. and, and other features of um, the other subtypes by definition, because that's that's what PCOS is androgen excess. So, if there's put this, I could say again, if there's no signs of androgen excess of any kind, like hirsutism or acne or measurably high androgens, then it's not PCOS. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, you know, in your experience, you know, um, what are some of the top three things that someone who has been told they have this diagnosis um, is most concerned about? Like what, what let's, let's kind of unpack the, the state of the patient and what they're going through when they're hearing about this condition. Like what, what is, what has been your experience? Well, I think probably the most distressing symptoms are the facial hair, body hair, and the weight gain Mm -hmm. and the skin, I guess those three, (laughs) and obviously Mm -hmm. infertility because with impaired ovulation, it's going to be difficult to achieve pregnancy. Although most, the research shows that most women with a PCOS diagnosis can go on to conceive naturally. So there's really, it's a functional impairment of fertility, but fertility can be restored as soon as ovulation is restored. So, yeah, I would say the facial hair, weight gain, and skin. Those are probably probably the big ones. Yeah. And then yeah. from a you know broader medical perspective, the concern is about the long-term sequelae, including the endometrial thickening, which we talked about earlier, but also all the metabolic long-term complications, which really come from flow out from insulin resistance. So having years of untreated an insulin resistance is going to increase cardiovascular risk, for example, especially as you mm-hmm. get, you know, up cheap menopause and later. And in fact, I just finished writing my next book on menopause. And so I had quite a few times I found I had to just, I was describing the situation. Like if, if you had PCOS or insulin resistance when you were younger, 
that's that insulin resistance is not going to go away. If anything, that's just going to get way worse with menopause. So you really need to, if insulin resistance has been identified, it's you want to reverse that ASAP, and then you can prevent. I would say most of those long term complications. The interesting thing about this mishmash of a diagnosis, just to go back to how confusing it is for women. So they'll say, okay, I have, I've been told I have PCOS, which may or may not have been an accurate diagnosis. Like if it was just diagnosed by, based on ultrasound, then there's a reasonable chance you don't have PCOS, but let's say, you know, woman's been told she has it. She goes and looks online and, you know, sees that, oh my goodness, all this can increase my long-term risk of, you know, of diabetes and heart attack and stroke and all these very scary sounding things. Just to clarify, that's only true if you have insulin resistance as part of mm -hmm. your what's going on. If you don't, if you have adrenal PCOS, there's not going to be any of these long-term sequelae, right? Like that's a very different situation. This is where the heterogeneity, heterogeneity of this comes in. Right. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes complete sense. Um, you know, I think, um, because there's so much difference between um, each people, each patient that's in, involved with this, that you know their set of risk factors are going to be unique to how they're presenting. It's an umbrella diagnosis. Think of it that way. It's like all you know. It's because it's just a, a just it's really just if you have the symptoms of androgen excess, then you fit under this umbrella diagnosis. Which means you can, if you can imagine, you've got all the women with you know very very different things going on. The skinny adrenal PCOS lumped under there with the you know, full-blown insulin resistant PCOS and they're under the same label, but they really shouldn't be because they're, what's going on with them is so fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, just to illustrate how important estrogen and progesterone are for combating androgen excess, I just want to describe something that maybe your listeners may or may not know that puberty in girls is a temporary PCOS state. So mm. puberty, that's, it's a, it's a stage of development, hormonal development that we go through where we get, as you know, it's kind of, um, you get androgens kind of surge up first, you know, pre-puberty. And then that's kind of what's building, pushing women towards being able to ovulate. And then there's a, there's a natural state of stage of mild insulin resistance. It's kind of normal for 12 year old girls. And then that's why they get a little bit of belly weight around that age, which is actually normal. And then what's supposed to happen is then ovulation starts to kick in. And then you make, start to make estrogen and progesterone, which push down on the androgens and help mm. and also help to normalize insulin resistance because estrogen is really beneficial for insulin sensitivity. And then you mature basically into having a more mature hormonal system where estrogen and progesterone are dominant. And you would typically, you know, then lose the belly weight and get more of that hourglass figure. That's kind of all that's from estrogen and progesterone. So some authors have argued that PCOS is like a stalled puberty. It's like you kind of get trapped in that 12 year old pre you know, puberty state. So I think that's quite interesting to think about. That and, is interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I've never heard that described. And I'm curious if we could maybe compare that to this other topic that you've mentioned, which is the testosterone dominance of menopause, kind of yeah. compare that. Oh, it's very similar. Yep. That you've, you've put your finger on it. Like that's when we lose estrogen and progesterone, we go through second puberty <laughs> and we move back into, we become by definition, testosterone, somewhat testosterone dominant with menopause. And it's, like I said, I wrote a whole book on this and I'm actually menopausal myself. So I can you know, speak to this. It's, it's in some ways it's sad to lose estrogen and progesterone because it's in mm -hmm. how great they are, I think, but also it's a natural, normal state of stage of life. And you know, I think, I guess the main challenge that comes with when we move back into that testosterone dominant state with menopause and what I really focus on in my book is what really, if we can, that's a, we can manage that. That's going to be okay. We're going to be in a different hormonal state for the next three decades. But what we really need to manage is that 
is the insulin resistance that can come with that. So because mm. testosterone can promote insulin resistance, we we do with menopause, as you know, as you know, we, we women become more vulnerable to insulin resistance. So it's part of a menopause management strategy is to yes, change the diet, you know, increase exercise to compensate for that. That's just the reality. I think, you know, I think I'm just, you, can, you probably hear my voice. I'm coming to terms with that myself. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. Body shape changes. We do become a little bit more testosterone dominant and it's, you know, it's okay. I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I would argue in my, and I argue in my book that, um, this evolved, this is how we evolved to be that, you know, there's many benefits to all these, these post-reproductive decades, but there is this kind of downside that we lose the superpowers of our estrogen and progesterone, unless we decide to take them as hormone therapy, mm-hmm. which is maybe a topic for a future podcast. <laughs> in terms of deciding yeah, for that. <laughs> yep. definitely. And, you know, to, to that, some women um, will have low testosterone in menopause as well. I mean, that's also shows well, up. You know, what's interesting is that what the literature shows is actually perimenopause is associated with a slight bump up in est- in testosterone, androgens. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. seems to be the normal, which is pretty analogous to that bump up in androgens with puberty, right? Like this just does seem to be sort of a, so the body dials that up. And then of course, when estrogen and progesterone drop away, then testosterone sh- shines through there is also at the same time, overall, the overall trajectory is that androgens are for both sexes on their way down. Like they're slowly, slowly going down over a lifetime. Mm-hmm. And, but I don't, I am pretty nervous about women taking testosterone with menopause. I, I'm not against it because I know it can help libido. I would just be very careful because I've seen patients who were diagnosed with supposedly testosterone deficiency in menopause. And I just don't really buy it. And I, I think the problem is if you're not careful with the dose, if you start supplementing testosterone, it's going to cause weight gain. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just not friendly to the me- metabolic system. So I would just be careful with that. I think also testosterone, because the levels are already so low for women relatively, it's you know hard to kind of get the right reference range and make sure. all about that. Thanks for pointing that out. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, so I know you have a number of things on your plate today, and so I, I don't want to hold you back from what you've got to get to, but I was hoping you could just leave us with a few take-home messages and then, um, or one or one take-home message even. And then if you could just let us know more about your work that you're doing and give us some updates on some of your new projects and how people can yeah. continue to follow you. I'm totally going to do all that. Before we finish, though, I'm going to mention one other thing, which I forgot to say. <laughs> Sorry, okay. <laughs> before content. But some of the research is showing around PCOS and engine excess and kind of the growing epidemic, because it really is becoming a lot more common in young women. And this is just kind of interesting from an evolutionary epigenetic perspective. There does seem to be growing evidence that some of the problem is stemming from prenatal androgen exposure. So being exposed, as a fetus being exposed to androgens, either because your, your mom has PCOS or because you're exposed to environmental toxins that have perhaps an androgenic effect, or I would argue, and there's not a lot of research for this, but your mom potentially having been on hormonal birth control that was high androgen Hmm. prior to conception. So there does seem to be this amplification happening generation by generation where girls, you know, were androgenized or (laughs) exposed to androgen in utero and then have a PCOS high androgen picture as an adult. And then, you know, potentially when they have a baby, then they're, because I, th- we know that if I forget the exact stat, but women with PCOS, their daughters are like highly likely to have PCOS as well. And I think a lot of it's coming from that androgen exposure. So that's just, I guess th- clinically that just means really do what you can to reduce androgens before pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And also it's just interesting from a biological evolutionary perspective of potentially what might be happening to us. Yes. Yeah. Some of our exposures. So yes. So in answer to your other question, um, the main thing I've got going on is my next, well, my, my, my current book period to prayer manual is still out there and reaching a lot of women. And I'm, you know, really grateful for that, excited about that. And then I've, I'm hoping to release my new book about perimenopause and menopause early next year. 
And meanwhile, as you say, I'm reasonably active on social media, blogging and social media. My blog is larabryden.com. My, all my social media accounts are at larabryden. I'm easy to find. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And just such great content. Um, I know that my patients reference you all the time. So <laughs> I, and I, I learned from you too. So thank you for continuing to be so generous with education. That's, you know, yeah. one of my passions too. It is. You know what, Adam, I think one of my mission statements I realized in the last few years is to demystify women's health. I think we've had this, had this narrative that, oh, women's health is so mysterious and complicated. And in actual fact, it's not. You know, I think this is my, what I'm trying to give to women is to understand how their bodies work and their bodies yeah. work by having regular ovulatory cycles. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's something called body literacy of being able to understand what your body's doing, if you're ovulating or not, if you're making progesterone or not, which you can just track with temperatures. A lot of this is just, you know, I'm trying to promote that knowledge to the people, <laughs> to everyone to have that and not, and remove, you know, so that women's health isn't only in the hands of specialists or, you know, experts, but in the hands of right. everyone. So, yeah, I love that. Like, you know, being able to know your body and someone trying, rather than someone trying to tell you what your body's doing. Yeah. And you still, it doesn't mean you don't need a doctor's help sometime because you, of course you sometimes do, but one of the, for example, one of the sections in period repair manual and also in my new book is how to talk to your doctor. Like what does the doctor speak? What are the language? What are the things you can say to try to all be on the same page? Yeah. And one of, for me, a lot of that, a lot of the time that comes back to, am I ovulating? Why am I not ovulating? Could insulin resistance be why I'm not ovulating? Can I focus on, you know, treating that and therefore restore ovulation <laughs> and, you know, regain my function because the body wants to ovulate it, this i mean you know as a naturopathic doctor this is one of our guiding principles the body if it's given half a chance it knows what to do it, it you know has it wants to do these things to be healthy so yeah well we need a dr lara app that would be <laughs> yeah. that's what's needed <laughs> after you get done writing all your books <laughs> yeah that would be that would be really helpful for people to kind of think have you as their kind of guide in their mindset to kind of be able to log things on a daily basis. I think that would go over really well. <laughs> I'll think about it. That's a big project. Okay, okay. Yeah. Just another yeah. thing to think about, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, thank you for yeah. your time. It's always great learning from you and catching up with you. And um, I know you've got to run. So um, uh, with that, uh, you know, we'll hope to catch up down the road and I'll look out for your, your new books. Right. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Now listen in for a preview of our next episode. On our next episode, we speak with Dr. Deanna Berman about interstitial cystitis. Listen in as we get to know our guest, Dr. Deanna Berman. On you becoming a naturopathic doctor. Um, well, my grandmother did. <laughs> she used to talk about natural health and and diet and exercise and natural treatments and from a very early age she was always giving me articles to read and um, she just was very interested in that and then um, when I was a teenager I had some issues and one of my teachers in high school was a chiropractor and taught me about acupressure now she would have lessons in the class my science teacher about acupressure so i had those influences yeah. early did grandma make a good chicken soup oh definitely my grandma made great chicken soup and she was a character she she was definitely one of my favorite people and very inspirational good a good mindset a philosopher wonderful and so what will we be learning during our interview together So I'm going to speak about interstitial cystitis and looking at it from a chronic health perspective, not just a localized bladder issue, and really understanding how you can recover from interstitial cystitis and you do not need to live with the symptoms and manage the symptoms and you can get off the medication. Excellent. And what's on your current reading list? I said, ha. (laughs) 
<laughs> okay, my current reading list.、Um, Some silly fiction book I always have before bed,、uh, but the other books I'm reading something called Sacred Success,、um, and The Feminine Mystique, and lots of journal articles about UTIs and the vaginal microbiome. My husband is definitely wanting me to stop talking about the vaginal microbiome. <laughs> <laughs> What is something you do personally to stay healthy? Well, I believe that. It's my responsibility to keep myself healthy, so I spend a lot of time on my own health. I exercise. I walk in nature. I live in the woods, so I have lots of places to walk. I grow a garden and I eat whole foods. I cook most of my meals. I dance. I do deep breathing exercises, and I try and recognize when I'm feeling stressed and do something to nourish myself. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the One Thing Podcast. Please share these episodes with your friends, loved ones, colleagues, patients, healthcare providers, anyone who you feel might benefit from hearing these informative interviews. We tend to learn best from people sharing things with us. That's often the first time it's introduced. So don't hesitate if these the content of these episodes reminded you of someone that might benefit from it. Forward the the episode to them and. I'm sure they'll either appreciate it or be appreciative that you've thought of them. So once again, we'll look forward to seeing you next episode on the One Thing Podcast. And again, much appreciation for you being here with me.